Management Program, uh, Tender Flicks, which is an experimental film prize festival, which will be coming up in November, um, and uh, really just supporting emerging artists in any way we can, um, which I guess would still fall into the purvey of this book as well, too, you know, <laughs> definitely. Um, the current exhibition is uh, Havoy Mayer and Janko Maddox, a couple of uh, Croatian uh, painters who are on right now until uh, the 6th of October. And uh, coming up next month, we have a German architecture firm called Padalab, who's doing a very elaborate installation uh, in the gallery. And then, of course, the film festival, which will be on the 1st of November. Um, so that's really it for right now. I'm going to introduce Stephanie here. Stephanie Bailey is the uh, publicity manager for Vivace Publishing, which uh, published the book. And I'll turn the floor over to her. Good evening, everyone. Um, speaking on behalf of the Vays, we are very proud to be the publisher of Etan's new book, Beyond Contemporary Art. It's been a fantastic experience for us at the Vays to work with Etan. He's had a truly diverse academic background, studying maths and physics at Stanford, getting a master's from film from the University of California, and second master's in interactive media at Goldsmiths. Through such varied fields of study, Etan has successfully combined art and the sciences in many of his projects. Contemporary art is a subject that invariably engenders a lively debate, and we ensure that beyond contemporary art will make a significant contribution to these discussions. As both an author and an academic, we have copies of Etan's article, Contemporary Art and Cybernetics, from the Leonardo Journal, published by MIT Press here this evening, if you'd like to read through. We're also selling the books tonight ahead of publication date at a discounted price of £20. So please take this opportunity to purchase a copy signed by the author himself. It's my pleasure to introduce Etan Duncan Elba. It's upside down. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, I hope uh, I'm speaking loudly enough. If anybody in the back needs me to raise my voice, uh, has any questions, please do speak up and, and say so. Uh, this is a nice, uh, intimate space here, all in all. So, um, so yeah, thank you to Stephanie and Liam for introducing me to the Hospital Club for uh, uh, when we have this talk, and thank you all for coming tonight. It's, uh, it's always uh, it's also it's always a pleasure to be able to engage an audience. Uh, uh, nothing nothing happens in a vacuum, so uh, a bit louder. Okay. So yes, uh, I'm, I'm really proud to, uh, to have my first book uh, out uh, beyond contemporary art. And we, we've got a few copies circulating around the room. So uh, if you see a copy near you, please uh, you know, flip through it. And you can also pass it around and let others take a look. So I've kind of got a show and tell going on at the same time. Um, and yeah, basically, I. Um, I come from a bit of an eclectic background, as mentioned, and I'm, I'm very interested in infusing different uh, disciplines. And, uh, and as the book suggests, um, it really is about going beyond contemporary art. So you'll find that there are entries in the book, uh, of which there are 90, 90 artists uh, profiled, some of the entries you might not necessarily consider to be typical artists. And I think that's very interesting. And the book uh, presents them alongside uh, uh, very famous, uh, well-known artists, uh, and, and emerging artists as well. So it's, uh, it is quite, uh, quite an interesting, interesting combination. Um, my background uh, also, as mentioned, uh, uh, I also founded Tender Pixel Gallery, which is a, a space in central London that supports emerging artists and designers and filmmakers. And uh, yeah, we also, I've got some clips here of uh, previous exhibitions, and, and we like to make uh, artist profiles. So I'll just play a, a quick clip. This uh, first clip is Max Hatler, who is a, a filmmaker, and this is from an exhibition of his. It's full screen. Yeah, it's always like that, right? It's, I always get technical issues when. Uh, technical. The whole process is sort of quite organic, like how I how I shoot um, and then how how I edit it afterwards. So I've got a camera pointing down and uh, I've got two fluorescent light strips, one at the bottom, one at the top of the um, of my table, and then 
Got the objects in the middle. I quite like the fact that it's sort of quite small and, and, and contained and underground. That you kind of have to go down. And That's the, uh, the basement of the gallery. World. <coughs> like what runs through my work is kind of uh, working with abstraction in, in some sense and maybe trying to explore what's around us in a, through abstraction. There's a, there's, that's like a three minute film on there and then these are just kind of like yeah. sculptures kind of thing, projected. So actually what, what, what happened with this one is that I pretty much shot it and then um, and then I reversed everything. So I actually shot this film in reverse, which is uh, not what I intended, but uh, it works much better. So that you know, it just shows how kind of un uh, planned these things sometimes can be. So that was a show earlier this year, and here's uh, also a clip uh, of Justin Gaynan and, and Emma Hunt to at a show last year. Ted or Pixel. artists and what we do is we always uh, once we, we select an artist to, to have a show we kind of let them do want us what, whatever they want that will guide them but we want them to create new work so every every exhibition in the gallery is something new and I think that's really important is to, to have a space for experimentation um, now moving towards the book and, uh, and also uh, uh, the art uh, art sphere in general I think it's really important to, to think about uh, the importance of ecosystems um, Nothing can really happen in a vacuum, and uh, and in order to foster creativity, it's uh, 
it's important to have uh, lots of things like art schools. London, for example, obviously has amazing schools. I was very fortunate to, to go to Goldsmiths. Um, art fairs, um, Freeze in London just started in 2003, and back then it only had 27,000 visitors, and uh, last year it had over 60,000 visitors, so it's quite quite an event. But there's lots of other great art fairs. There's Kinetic Art Fair, I don't know if you've heard of that, which is uh, all about kinetic art and, uh, and technology, which is really a great fair as well. And uh, museums are very important, galleries, obviously even uh, spaces for, uh, for people to come and meet and speak, like a uh, members club, like the hospital club here tonight. That's uh, uh, an excellent example of a place that, uh, let's say, uh, a creative hub. And, uh, and these ecosystems, they, you know, they're, they're vital for, uh, for, the, uh, for exchanging ideas and cross-pollinating different, uh, different industries. So, and obviously having critics, magazines, journals, uh, and different, uh, different performance spaces, all of that, that, that is really, really vital. And I think uh, you know, it's, it's, there, there's a reason why a lot of uh, urban areas and, and metropolis, uh, why the metropolis is such a great place for creativity. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you get cross-pollination between things like graphic design, uh, architecture. I think, uh, I think that's uh, one, of the, one of the great things about a, a, cult, a creative hub is that you get all this, uh, all these interactions, and more and more you're seeing blurring of boundaries today. It's not, you know, it's not so clear what the difference is between an inventor and uh, and a designer, or between uh, a designer and an artist, right? So I think that's very interesting. Um, recently, there was the uh, Metamorphoses. Uh, um, well, there was the Royal Opera uh, uh, show of Metamorphoses. Uh, Titian's uh, Metamorphoses, which uh, was also an exhibition at the National Gallery. Um, so that was very interesting, where they actually took some contemporary artists, such as uh, Chris Ophelia, Mark Wallinger, and, uh, and also Conrad Shawcross, and, uh, and had them come in and try out being set designers and costume designers. And, uh, and so you've got all this cross-pollinating going on, and, uh, and then finally it resulted in an exhibition. And this is, this is a piece from... Uh, from the exhibition that just finished yesterday at the National Gallery, where they had uh, uh, there was a piece called Diana, where there was a little shed, and uh, anybody could look through this little uh, little peeping hole, uh, this little keyhole, and see a uh, a nude bather uh, as though she's the goddess Diana, and see what it was like to perhaps be Acteon. So uh, that that was quite interesting, um, and uh, and again questions also what what is. Uh, you know what is contemporary art? What, what, what would you see, uh, you know, right? What, what it, you know in, in an art space or art as street art? Um, so you're getting increased hybridization and uh, and a mix of uh, of different disciplines. I um, I think it's also interesting to see that a lot of uh, um, celebrity artists these days they're crossing over and succeeding in, in different fields. You've got people like Miranda July who's a, uh, an exceptional filmmaker. I don't know if you've seen her film, uh, Me and You and Everyone We Know, but uh, it's a great film, and, uh, and she's, she's got a lot of other films. And she's also a renowned artist. And this is a, a sculpture of hers from the Venice uh, Biennale in 2009. Um, you can kind of see it. You can, uh, it says, this is not the first hole my finger has been in, nor will it be the last. You can kind of poke your finger in there. She's cute. and. Uh, and then going back to, to the mix between performance art and, and installation art, you've got people like Marina Abramovich, who had a huge uh, uh, um, blockbuster exhibition at the MoMA in 2010 called The Artist is Present, where she basically sat uh, uh, for seven hours a day for three months, and uh, anybody could come and visit the gallery and just sit across here and stare at her. So an amazing uh, piece in terms of stamina and uh, a very, very successful uh, uh, exhibition. So uh, it, it's really interesting to, to think about uh, the flow of ideas and, uh, and also how I think uh, now more than ever before, you're seeing flow, the flow of ideas not just between all these different physical ecosystems, but also virtual ecosystems, um, such as uh, uh, the, the internet, and, uh, and there's a lot of other uh, other data out there. Um, so 
this is actually actually a piece by Aaron Bartal, and uh, it's a sculpture of uh, the Google Maps uh, icon, and uh, which I thought, I thought was quite uh, quite cute, and uh, and it really you know really questions what is uh, what is real and what what is virtual, and uh, and there really is a blurring of boundaries and certainly uh, uh, categories as well. Um, you know, what one can wonder what's what's the difference between seeing uh, an avant-garde film in a gallery or in a museum, or watching uh, a YouTube video that someone made at home. I mean, you know, the the distinction can really be uh, it's uh, it's hard and harder to, to distinguish between these things, and uh, um, I think that's that's really really interesting. Um, and so, obviously, there's always the question: what what is contemporary art, right? Uh, um, and uh, that's that's a bit of a loaded term. Um, we had uh, we had modern art beforehand, and obviously we're past modern art. We're we're, we're in a postmodern and maybe post postmodern uh, period. Uh, but uh, um, but contemporary art basically it, uh, it 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 refers to the present, and uh, and contemporary is uh, is basically the last forty years. Um, my book focuses on on the last. Uh, the last decade, but uh, contemporary, yeah, it's basically it moves all the time and shifts. And art is a very fluid uh, term. You know, uh, some theorists claim that uh, anything is art as long as the artist claims that it's art. And uh, you've got uh, a famous example here of uh, Duchamp's urinal, where he basically just took urinal and submitted it to, to for an exhibition. It was actually refused, but, uh, uh, but that's very interesting that... that uh, a ready-made object uh, is uh, can be can be an art piece. Brian uh, Youngen is uh, uh, a very famous uh, artist today. Also, he's in the book. He he takes a lot of pre-made objects and puts them into uh, novel contexts. So here uh, you can see he's got a gallery installation where uh, he's basically created these totem poles out of golf bags. Um, so. Um, that's uh, that's that's very very interesting. Um, I think that uh, the the idea of uh, of an art object is uh, you know it, it's something that's constantly shifting and uh, and being debated. And an art object can be many things. It can be uh, obviously uh, uh, a sculpture or uh, perhaps uh, even uh, uh, an architectural piece. Uh, Anish Kapoor's Cloud Gate. Uh, which uh, is in Chicago, is, is a wonderful example of, uh, of something that blares the line between sculpture and architecture. And, uh, and you've got a lot of artists that are, are doing that um, these days. And uh, an art object could also be something like uh, Grayson Perry's uh, uh, ceramic base here, or, uh, or even an iPhone app, uh, which this is, this is an app that uh, Stephanie Posevich is an amazing graphic designer. Uh, made for uh, for Stephen Fry's My Fry app, uh, but uh, or or an Antony Gormley sculpture. So so yeah, so an art object can be many many things, and that's that's very interesting. And um, and also art objects often they you know artists will try and bring things that make you think and uh, and wonder also and reinterpret uh, uh, and create a discourse. Uh, this is an interesting piece from uh, a photographer, a very young photographer in New York named Grace Brown, who uh, has been photographing, uh, well first can you, when you look at this picture, do you think it's, uh, what does it make you feel? Is it, uh, is it sad, happy, what, uh, what do people think? Not sure? Curious. Curious. Well, um, so it's a, this is a very interesting piece where she's been Actually, photographing victims of sexual abuse and uh, and having them as part of their healing process, ha photographing them uh, with a sign that uh, has a, that says basically what the person who raped them said right before the the act took place. So a very loaded, uh, you know, and obviously uh, 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 image. And, and, and you know, when you look at it first, you know, you you don't necessarily see that. So art art really is very interesting. There's uh, you know, it creates a whole world and. And, and it can be so many things, uh, and, and a healing uh, vehicle as well, obviously. So um, I think that uh, 
one of the interesting things when you when you talk about the the ready-made is is to consider uh, if there's a new form of ready-made in the 21st century, and and I would suggest that perhaps uh, information is a new form of ready-made because it's all over, right? And uh, you can basically just take it and present it, and you've already and you can and claim it as such, and it can be art. So. Um, it's very interesting to think, uh, think about information, and certainly digital information, which is something that can be easily manipulated, uh, replicated, and instantly transferred. Um, digital information is, uh, I think, in a sense, is, is the new, the new ready-made. Um, and, uh, and information is, is also a very complicated uh, uh, concept, uh, which actually I, I talk about in my article, which you're welcome to take a look at. Because on one hand, information means that it's uh, devoid of form, right? Not having form or, or giving form to infuse form, or it's it's pure data. And anyway, it's it's information is very it's a very interesting uh, concept. I uh, I've been experimenting with uh, uh, a series of uh, programs that I've been writing that create uh, different uh, visual. Uh, uh, um, animations out of really simple mathematical uh, formulas. So this here is a uh, little screen. It's just a little video that a program that I wrote created that uh, uses mathematical algorithms to just create patterns using to create random patterns and then they evolve into some sort of target object. So here it's a bunch of chess pieces. But I'll just show that again. So it was one of one single black cell that split up and, and came, came into all these other other cells, and finally, uh, a pattern that can be actually seen. So I did that with Mathematica. I don't know if anybody's did that program. So yeah, so I think that um, you've got a lot of artists. Also, in this book, you, you can see uh, Jeremy Wood, who's a, uh, a pioneer of GPS art. So basically, kind of at the, at the beginning of uh, um, uh, when GPS uh, devices were uh, accessible for consumers, he he started carrying a GPS uh, receiver and tracking all of his movements everywhere he went. And, uh, and this here is a piece, it's called My Ghost, and uh, it's basically 10 years of data of his uh, moving around London. So uh, there's nothing else on, on the, uh, you know, just a black background and white, uh, uh, white lines that represent that data. And it's very interesting because you can see the city's infrastructure, because people are constrained to move around buildings, and uh, obviously you've got you know, rivers, you've got the Thames, and um, and uh, and he also, Jeremy is also very interested in, in, at exploring different different uh, different ideas, and sometimes he writes Moby Dick quotes by walking around. So uh, actually, at the uh, bottom right, it's kind of hard to see, I think, but uh, he's got a quote that says. It is not down in any. Uh, it is not down in any map. True places never are, which is a Moby Dick quote. And uh, so, yeah, very very interesting. And again, another example of, um, of 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 a lot of data, and we're constantly creating data every, everywhere we go. And it's an example of just taking that data, putting it in a form that's presentable, and uh, and creating a visual uh, visual piece. This is uh, a piece by Aaron Coblin, who's uh, uh, uses processing, which is a, a great, uh, great computer language. It was written primarily for artists to use, uh, so it's quite, uh, it's quite artist friendly. You don't need to know that much uh, programming. And he uh, here, Aaron took a bunch of flight data and uh, and created uh, this uh, uh, this beautiful series of, uh, of flight patterns. And here, this is the northeastern part of the the U.S. And you can see these networks. Uh, uh, and this is all from one one single day of, uh, of flights. So that's uh, that's really interesting. And that's also on the cover of the book is uh, is the flight data. And and it's also interesting to think that there's uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of artworks that really do go beyond what we consider to be traditional art. <coughs> um, Natalie Jermajenko is uh, a professor of uh, visual art at uh, at NYU. And uh, she's got a background in, uh, in electrical engineering, uh, where, where she did a PhD in before she became uh, an artist. And she's been creating a lot of very interesting uh, pieces where she tries to create uh, interspecies communications. Uh, so 
This here is uh, it's a fish uh, uh, LED uh, array, and basically, uh, whenever fish swim swim under it, the lights, uh, the LED lights, light up. So you can kind of track the movements of the fish, and uh, and uh, it's a way to kind of to have interspecies communication. So that's uh, that's certainly very very interesting, and it goes beyond a lot of what you might consider to be traditional uh, traditional art. Um, the, the book also talks a lot about different forms of uh, urban interventions. Um, obviously, you've got uh, people like Invader, which you've probably seen uh, a lot of his works uh, around Soho, where there are these mosaics uh, based on uh, the Space Invader aesthetic, and uh, they're all over. And he's, he's also uh, had copycat artists uh, all over the world, also all his work, and he's... Uh, yeah, he's tagged a lot of a lot of major cities, including Hong Kong, L.A., Paris, and uh, Banksy is a great example of someone who's both a, a street artist, but also um, has been exhibited in uh, uh, in museums and uh, has also infiltrated museums. Uh, he, he and uh, and is also a uh, a successful filmmaker. His uh, uh, his his movie Exit Through the Gift Shop is really a wonderful, wonderful film that I, I highly recommend. And, and Banksy really epitomizes a lot of what it means to be a successful artist today, where you, you can cross over from one, one domain to another, which is, which is very interesting. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of street artists are doing that. Aaron Bartal, who we saw previously, is uh, a Google Map sculpture. He's also been doing this really cool project uh, called Dead Drops where he basically goes around, uh, around a city and just uh, installs USB sticks. Uh, and, uh, and anybody, basically anybody can, down, can upload data to these USB sticks or, uh, or upload or change whatever the, the content is, is, is in there. And, and it's basically it's a real peer-to-peer -peer network. And uh, uh, that's a very interesting example of, uh, of a street uh, intervention. Uh, and also something that uh, creates a, an emerging art form because you don't know what will happen. That's, that's also very interesting. When you create these platforms, anything is possible. There could be another art uh, um, piece that may build off of that piece because he's creating a, a sort of network. And that's, that's very interesting. Um, and um, one, one of the things that I, uh, I also want to like uh, emphasize here is that uh, as you've got all this, all these, all these mixes between different domains and, and constant experimentation, you you see crossovers between fashion, design, architecture, um, and uh, you know, I mean, you've got people like uh, obviously Ai Weiwei, who's he's in the book, and he's an example of someone who's both an activist and has had uh, different architectural projects, uh, uh, including obviously the Bird's Nest Stadium and. Uh, and recently, the uh, he had a, uh, at the Serpentine Pavilion, he, he put a really nice pavilion together out of court, which I think is still there now. Um, so, and he's got a movie. Well, he didn't make it though. A movie about him, but uh, but he's, he works in lots of different media, and uh, and I think I think it's very interesting to see all these all this crossover. Takashi uh, Murakami is another example of someone who has worked in. Uh, in, in fashion, right, collaborating with Louis Vuitton, and uh, and also created lots of other different art, lots of other art forms from sculptures to to videos to uh, to you name it. So it's it's very interesting to see celebrity artists really you know jumping uh, from one domain to another. But you see that across uh, uh, across all fields. I mean, there there are lots of emerging artists doing that, and you, there's just a lot more interaction today, I think, than, than ever before. Um, this is a great piece of, uh, by Karsten uh, Holler in, uh, at the uh, Turbine Hall at the Tate Modern, where uh, he, he has a fascination with slides, and he just created these huge slides that visitors could, uh, could, actually, uh, could actually use. And, um, and here's uh, a Turner Prize winning artist, uh, Simon Starling, who had a beautiful piece at the uh, Venice Biennale in 2009, which you can kind of see it's a spiral um, where you've got film spiraling around. It's a very long film that goes into this projector, and the actual film is uh, a 
of the uh, uh, of the factory where the projector was built. So a highly uh, highly reflexive uh, piece that's uh, that's also very very interesting and combines. Simon Starling is is someone who is a conceptual artist and has worked in so many different media, and that's 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 very interesting uh, that uh, uh, that you're seeing all of this uh, all of these interactions. Um, Another artist, uh, and he, by the way, yeah, both of them are, are in the book. Uh, um, and uh, another, I guess, thing to take away is that uh, contemporary artists can be hackers, um, filmmakers, sculptors, designers, uh, architects, and uh, and that that's cool. I think that um, I think that it's silly to have uh, all of these uh, distinctions. I mean, uh, all too often you you know. If you you know people, different academic academic departments might try and, and pigeonhole uh, someone's practice, but I you know, I'm very much against that. I think uh, I think it's important to be to really be open minded, uh, and uh, fortunately you're seeing a lot more of that uh, in art schools today. Um, Ryoji Ikeda, who's uh, also in the book, uh, is a great example of uh, someone who's both uh, a highly successful uh, composer and. Uh, um, and a visual artist who's been presented in, in a lot of uh, leading museums. And uh, I'm going to show a piece uh, of his uh, installation, let's see here, called The Trans Infinite. example and quickly just DJing, VJing. 